you're new here, my name is Scott Brooks. I'm the lead pastor, teaching pastor. Glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we are in a sermon series uh, in Matthew 1. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and grab it. Matthew 1, and the, um, the sermon series is Advent, and the, and the, the, the series title uh, name is He Came For You. So we're looking at Advent, the arrival of Jesus Christ, on the purpose of which he came, and, and, and that is he came for you. We're looking at Matthew 1, and, and looking at the lineage, the family line of Jesus Christ, because not only does it tell us uh, who Jesus is, but to, but to whom he came for. Um, the sermon title this morning is this, The Deliverer Delivers. And so Jesus, being delivered, he actually delivers. If you're taking uh, notes this morning, the, the Deliverer Delivers, and um, that's kind of redundant uh, on purpose. And the reason why... Um, I say that, that Jesus Christ being the, the deliverer actually delivers, is um, I, am, I am pretty overwhelmed in, in, uh, in life. Like, so um, I, I see things in life, and, and I would look at them, and I usually think they don't meet my expectations. And so um, I, am, I, am, I feel like I'm oversold a lot, and in that, they never kind of fulfill uh, the appetite of which they were, were told to me or sold to me. So that usually goes something like this. You have to try, you know, this food at this restaurant. You will, you will love it. It is the best food you'll ever have, you know. And then, then I'll go there and, and I'll eat it. And almost every time my thought is, well, I've, I've had better, right? It was good, but not, it wasn't great. Uh, if someone tells me this is the best movie uh, you, you know, I've ever seen, um, I'm like, you know, I'll see it. Then I was like, well, I've seen better, right? Unless they're referring to Braveheart. Uh, I know they're lying to me, right? So uh, this is a side note. I wasn't going to say this. It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. You should go see that movie, right? I'm seeing some nods. Incredible movie. It's about Mr. Rogers. Got to stay on point. It will not deliver as, as much as I say it will, but it's fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, if I hear a song. Um, I, you know, it takes me some time. Usually I'll catch on, but I, it's just hard to, to, to meet the expectations when someone sets them. Um, you know, the Cowboys had great expectations, and some people are still delusional and think they have a shot, and maybe they do, uh, but they under-deliver. Uh, what we've been doing this, this weekend is having testimonies uh, that testifies to the, the, the glory of Christ that he delivers. Uh, and if you're here yesterday, we had some tremendous testimonies, and today we'll have some at the next gathering. Uh, it's people standing up and saying, Jesus exceeds our expectations. Like, whatever you think that he is, he's more and better and more glorious and more merciful and sweet. And so you can't, like, over-glorify um, Christ or set too high of expectations. There's one guy that got baptism, uh, baptized last night. He goes, I'm not much of a talker. But man, you get me talking about Jesus, I can talk. And he did. Why? Because Jesus delivers. Um, and that's the, the, the point of this. The deliverer, being Jesus, delivers on what he says. We're going to look at this morning that David has testimony. So in the realm of Celebration Weekend, uh, people baptizing and sharing their testimonies of their real experiences they've had with Christ, we're going to look at David, uh, the, David, the person in the Bible, his testimony. And we're going to look at it uh, kind of in a myriad of ways. Why? Because the Bible gives us several angles to look at David's testimonies. Not just one, that testify to the glories of Christ. And we find that in Matthew 1. So if you have your Bible, look at Matthew 1. It says this, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So we're tracing the family uh, tree of, of Jesus it says, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, what? The son of David and the son of Abraham. So last week we talked, or two weeks ago, we talked about God is a covenant keeper, uh, meaning that he is given certain promises and that God always delivers on his promises. And it started way back as uh, Adam and Eve, they fell, sin entered into the world, that God had a plan, a magnificent plan uh, to redeem, and he gave his promise to Abraham. So we went all the way back to Genesis, and we looked at the very beginning. That's the first book in the Bible. Although we are separated from God through sin and we deserve death, God says, man, I'm going to make a promise to Abraham. And we read about in, uh, Genesis 12, 15, and 17, and we read 
Genesis 12, verse 3, it'll be up on the screen maybe, I don't know, yes, I will bless those who bless you, and in, in, in him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so uh, God gives Abraham in this promise that says that all, all the families of all the earth will be blessed through what? Your offspring. Now, he gave that to Abraham, and he reaffirms that in Genesis 15 and 17, that through the line of Abraham, an offspring, that all the families will be blessed. Now, we know uh, because of history and salvation history that that was Christ, and he was the offspring, and anyone that puts their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved and have eternal life, and they uh, they are brought in into the, the blessing of Abraham. Why? Because that was the promise given from God. We see now David is on the same line here as Abraham. Why? Because it's all part of this idea that God is a promise keeper, a covenant keeper. So we hear about this promise is going to come through Abraham. We have further disclosure as it's given to David that God is indeed keeping his promise. It says this, that God gave this promise uh, to David in 2 Samuel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down. That means when he dies with his fathers, I will raise up what your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I'll establish his kingdom. Listen, and he shall build a house for my name and I'll establish the throne of what? His kingdom forever. And I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. So you have this promise given to Abraham all these hundreds of of years ago and that all the nations will be blessed through his offspring. Now we see this promise coming to fruition and not only will all the nations be blessed, but this kingdom that he's establishing in his offspring will never end. It will always go on forever and it's given to David. God is telling us through the line of Christ through said this promise through Abraham and David, something about his character and nature, that he is a promise keeper, that he is the unchangeable. What God is going to establish what he says he will do. Now, that is an amazing truth. It says in Scripture that all God's promises find their yes in Jesus Christ. Now, how this is ministered to me is God is, God's unchangeableness has ministered to me because we live in an ever-changing world. And the fact that God can be my anchor and my constant in his steadfast love and his promises and his security has brought a lot of, um, I would say, security in my life right now because I'm starting to really understand that God, God delivers that he is unchangeable. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and my anchor should be only anchored in him. I have been struggling with anxiety. Now, um, I know that's kind of like a buzzword these days, and so I don't really like saying it. Like everyone else saying it, I don't want to say it, but that just the truth is, I don't know why. And I was really trying to figure out why am I struggling with being anxious? This is not my nature. I've not experienced this and the reason why is I thought about it is I love my life. Like, I love it. Like, I love, I love my wife. I, like, I love hanging out with her. Uh, I love the thought of, you know, having dinner with her. And the thought that, like, something could change in our relationship makes me anxious. Like, I love the stage of life that my kids are in. Like, I look at them, and I'm just like, wow. You know, I, you don't look at them when you see my kids. But they're my kids, and they're extraordinary. And I love everything about this season of life. I look at all of them and think they're extremely special. I'm grateful for their health. I'm just grateful. By God's grace, we are going to have money to the end of the month. And I know that's like a, not a, that's a win. Like we're going to eat the whole month. And, and to me, that's, that's security. Uh, I look at my health. I don't know if you know this or not. I can run and not get that tired, and that makes me happy. I can go out with my kids, and I can roll uh, in the yard. We can rake leaves together, and I'm looking at my life, and I'm getting nervous that it's going to change because I know it's what? I know it's a season. I know my wife could change. I know my health could change. I know my finances could change. I know my kids are changing, 
right? You get these little, you know, yearly updates, or Marcy shows me on her phone, like, hey, this was five years ago today. I'm like, wow. Uh, anyway, things change. Now, the problem is, I think they're going to be changing for the worst, because I'm not looking to the character and nature of God, but I'm looking to the temporalness of this world. And the fact that God is the unchangeable and his love and his provision and he is my security, man, it gives me a peace of mind as I go through scenes of life because I know in Christ, it's always an upward trajectory. Although there'll be hurts in my life, in Christ there will always be healing. Although there may be a story that's hard, God's always will be present with me through those stories. Although there may be death, what happens in death? There's resurrection. See, the security and the unchangeableness in Christ is where my hope and affection is alive. In that, there's a great peace of mind. But if I look at the world and how everything's changing, I man, it gives me a great deal of anxiety. And Christmas is giving us an anchor for our lives saying there's a refuge here, there's a promise here. Look to the character and nature of God that he is a covenant keeper and he has you and he'll provide for you throughout your life and for eternity. Now, kind of moving forward from being a promise keeper, not only <clears throat> is God mentioned this, or and Matthew mentions this in Matthew 1, it says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There's a line of promises being fulfilled by the unchanging, always covenant-keeping God. It says that Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of, of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. If you weren't here last week, we talked about that's an extraordinary story. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the fa father of Adimdadad, and Adimdadad, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Ruth, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David the king. So again, now David's mentioned again, but now he's not mentioned on this, this promise of covenant as to Abraham uh, going into the line of David. Now he's saying that David is the son of Jesse. Now, if you don't know that story, there's another, another testimony to the glories of Christ, uh, just that he's the son of Jesse. If you don't know that story, in 1 Samuel 16, um, Samuel was told by God that he is taking the kingship away from Saul because he's not devoted, uh, he's not being devoted to, to, to God. So Saul's losing uh, the kingship. Samuel is told to go to Bethlehem. That's where the line of Christ is, actually comes from. But he goes to Bethlehem, go get Jesse. One of his sons is going to be the next king. And so Jesse hears about it. He brings his sons, and he brings all seven in front of them. And then Samuel looks at the first one and says, clearly this one has to be the king. He is tall. He is handsome. He is strong. He can swing a big sword to protect his country. And God said to Samuel, this is not the one. So the next one in line, maybe not as tall and strong, but maybe there's something about this person, this son. And Samuel tells, uh, or God tells Samuel, this is not the one. So they go through all seven. And, 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 and God tells Samuel, the, none of these are the king. And so Samuel looks at Jesse, he's like, do you have any other sons? And he's like, oh yeah, I have my youngest, but he's out with the sheep. You, you, you know, you don't want him. Now, I don't know what you're thinking, but I, here's what I'd be thinking. If I was, you know, eight sons, and my dad's like, hey, new, there's Samuel, the prophet's coming in, right? New king is gonna be picked from our line. He's gonna look at all the boys, and then Jesse looks at you, David, why don't you go take care of the sheep? I'd be like, am I not a son? I mean, they, who, who knows? God may, may choose me. He's like, no, why don't you go take care of the sheep? I mean, this had to be, man, devastating relationship with him and his father, not even to consider bringing him, right? And so the point that I'm making is Jesse did not consider David, that, that he was forgotten. Why? Because he was forgettable. Now, I don't know where you're at in your stage of life, but if you feel like God maybe has forgotten you, this is to affirm that he hasn't. Maybe you feel like your spouse looks over you, or maybe your parents don't pay attention to you if you're a child. Maybe the coach doesn't give you a time or day. This story and testimony from David is that God doesn't forget you. He doesn't forget you. Jesus says something amazing on the Sermon on the Mount. 
He says that who, who did he come for? God came what, from, for the lowly, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the persecuted, the simple, those who mourn. It's not how the world sees. God doesn't pick how everyone else sees, the, the strong, the people who are achieving. He looks for the people that are down and out, the forgettable and the forgotten. He comes to them and he, and, he, and he sees them and he loves them. He even talks about this more clearly in 2 Samuel 7, 8, and 9 about how David became king. It says, now therefore thus you shall, you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts. So God's talking I took you from your pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I, I'm emphasizing that, that's God, have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. The emphasis is what? Who made David great? God did. It says God, God didn't forget him, that he had a plan for him and he sought him. I hope that ministers to some this morning, that, that maybe you feel forgotten, that God sees and does not forget. There's a principle in Christianity that's been twisted and forgotten, and it's the main principle of Christ Christianity, is that Christianity does not start with you. It starts with Christ. I need you to hear that, right? It didn't start with David, it started with God. And his plan for him, God doesn't look at the people that have, have and are achievable and can be used a lot. Christianity starts with Christ, not you. See, the idea here is the sovereign love and grace of God. The reason why God loves you is why? It's because he loves you. There's nothing that you can point within yourself for the reason that God loves you. And that's what's so baffling. God loves you, why? Because he loves you. And his love is what changes you. You don't earn it, you don't achieve it, he simply gives it. We are recipients of the great love of God in Jesus Christ. That's what defines us. Do you know that? See, there's a twisted principle. Most people think that Christianity is about God loves the good people. That he will make, he will bring, he'll give righteousness to the people who do all the right things. That God will love all the kind people. Instead of understanding, it's God's character that makes us. See, God's love, what, makes us lovely. It's God's kindness that makes us kind. It's God's rightness that makes us righteousness, that makes us right before God. It's God's mercy that makes us a merciful people. It's God's generosity that makes us generous. God makes us who we are in his son, Jesus Christ. That is the testimony of David, and that's the testimony that would anyone that called themselves a Christ follower, that we are great recipients of the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. The last thing I want you to see about David's testimony, because he's testifying to the truth of who, who God is in this line, it says, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now, I'm going to read that again. David was the father of Solomon. That's his son by what? By the wife of Uriah. That's intentionally wrote that way, right? That's interesting wording. He didn't say, and David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba. Well, that would be true, right? He went out of his way to say that he had a child with another man's wife, and that is in the family line of Christ. Now, why in the world would he say, man, that Jesus Christ came through an adulterous relationship? Why? Because the story is that you and I are way more of a mess than we could ever really understand. And we need to see this in David. This is David's testimony. If you don't know David's testimony on this, that how in the world did he have a child with the wife of Uriah? It's found in 2 Samuel 11. I'll run through the story very quickly. At the season and time where kings should go out for war, David didn't go. He had the sin of omission. He was supposed to go defend his country and, and, and provide a, a place of res, refuge. Instead, he stayed. So he didn't do what he's supposed to be doing. And then it says he's lounging on a couch in the afternoon. I'm going to tell you something. You should never be lounging on your couch in the afternoon. Know why? Nothing good happens there. 
nothing, right? You're probably scrolling at things, looking at things, wishing you maybe have a different life than you have. Like there's a lot of things that happen with you being idle in the afternoon on a couch, but that's where David was because he wasn't obeying God and doing what he should be doing. Then he sees a wife bathing on his balcony. He inquires of this beautiful woman he sees bathing. He says, oh, this is, this is Uriah's wife. So he hears, oh, this, is, this is a taken woman. He should have been, all right, you know, I should have been at war, I shouldn't be looking. But instead, he goes, has her brought to, to him. He sends for, it says that he sends for her and he takes her. That means he sleeps with her somewhat against her will. She becomes pregnant. And then instead of confessing, man, he tries to cover, he sends for Uriah, her husband, brings him home from war because he was fighting, he, sh- he, he was where he should have been. And he tries to get a, a man who comes back from war, uh, home from war to go, go to his wife, which most men would because they haven't seen their wife in a while. But he says, how could I go home when the Ark uh, of the Covenant is at war? God's presence is out there. How could I not be with my friends? I mean, a great man of integrity says, I can't be with my wife when God is out there and my, my men are out there, and so he wouldn't go to his wife. So then David tries to get him drunk, and in, instead of going home after he's drunk, hopefully to lower his integrity and ambitions, he finds him sleeping out front. So David sends him with a letter that he, um, he sends a letter with Uriah, and he rides the letter states, man, to draw back on the, the fiercest fighting so he'd be struck down, and then he, is, then he is killed. Now, I want you to hear David's testimony. I want to know what you think. The facts of the Scripture says that he is lazy. He is not a good king. He's not doing what he should do. That he is an adulterer, rapist, and a murderer. This is, this is the account Now, would you say that he should, that he's guilty? Well, I would hope so. Do you think he should be judged? I mean, think raped, murder. You think he should have a sentencing? Yeah, some are like, the high justice people, there's there's still some people that are like, nah, he deserves mercy. Like, no, you know, all right, we'll see what he thinks, all right? So Nathan doesn't, doesn't see his blindness, David doesn't even see his lostness. And part of the story of Advent, of Christ's coming, is the idea is you and I do not see our own lostness. We're blind to our sin, just as David is. So David has this all done. He's like, man, you know, not the way that I want it to happen, but let's just move on, right? But God is not okay with just covering sin and just moving on, Nathan the prophet comes to him uh, in 2 Samuel uh, 12 and tells David a story because he doesn't see the wretchedness of his own sin or the judgment that he should have or the lostness that he's in. And he tells him a story. There's two men. There's one rich, one poor. The rich man has many sheep and is very rich and wealthy. There's a poor man who has one lamb that treats that lamb like a daughter to him. And then there's a guest that comes into the city and the rich man, instead of taking one of his sheep, goes and grabs that one poor man's lamb, sacrifices it so he can keep all that he has. And then the response of David to the story and the injustice is this. 2 Samuel 12, verse 5 and 6 says, Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this, what deserves to die? And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. See, the story of Christmas is to help us understand the truth that we are David in the story, that we deserve to die. And when Nathan, man, tells him the story, he gets to the righteous judgment. We deserve death. That man deserves to die. And the, the truth of this story, the, why, the reason why it's written that way, he's saying, you're no different than this adulterer and that you deserve to die. He got the right judgment because Christmas doesn't make any sense. When I say he came for you, you'd probably be like, well, that, that sounds nice. I don't know why he came. I seem like I'm doing all right. No, that's not the story of Christmas. The reason why Jesus came for you 
is why? To save you from what? Why do we say the Savior came? He came to save you from the righteous wrath of God that deserved to be pointed at you and me, that we deserve to die. See, the story of Christmas is the judgment that death is what we earn, that the wrath of God should be pointed at us. And by God's grace and the Holy Spirit, I hope that you can see this morning, this is why Jesus Christ entered in. So as this story was told to David by Nathan, he has this spirit rot moment of illumination. He's like, oh no, I'm the one that deserves to die. I pray that you would have that moment. It says Psalm 51, verse one and three, as the choir master, a Psalm of David, when Nathan, the prophet, went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, that's Uriah's wife, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Listen, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. See, the point of Advent is what? To put the sins ever before you. To understand that you deserve to die and that we would echo what David says and says, my sin is before me. Please blot out my sins. Have mercy on me. And that's exactly why Christ came. He came to have mercy on you, to take the judgment that you and I deserve. We'll sing a song that Garrett will sing with the band that Jesus was what? He was born to die. Why? To take on our judgment, to take on our sin, to take on our penalty so what? We can have life, that we can have the favor of God. We can have the forgiveness of God, the grace of God. It says this in Isaiah 43, verse 25. It says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins no more. By the power of the Holy Spirit, our sin is brought before us, but then we see Jesus came to be our Savior, to save us from the wrath of God the judgment of God so we can have life. He was born to blot out our transgressions, but God doesn't even remember it anymore because they've been paid in full. He now sees us just through the love and grace that Jesus Christ has provided for us. We're gonna respond in song, and this song is gonna be the testimony that Jesus Christ came for a reason to die in your stead. And I pray by the Holy Spirit that you respond in thankfulness, in praise, in worship, I have a position of gratefulness that God was merciful to me and you, a sinner in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, I hope that you would help us see the truth of Christ. I pray, God, that the testimonies of David would minister to our hearts, whether that's that you gave him a promise and that you're a promise keeper, that, you, God, you're unchangeable. I pray that you move our affections and our hope away, away from the temporalness of this world, but the unwavering character of you, God, that you are a good father who will always be a refuge for us. I pray that we can look to the testimony of David, that God, you don't forget about us, that you see us. And God, that we would respond and worship that you have a plan for us. And that we remember that Christianity starts with Christ, not us, and that we can be worshipful in that. And I pray that as our sin is ever before us, that we'd also see so is our Savior, and he came to die in our stead. Help us respond in spirit and truth this morning. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen.